Mm-hmm. Wait, it said your stream ended. Oh, there now it says streaming. Okay. You're live and recording is what I just saw. All right. Hello. Abarsh, we see you in the waiting room. Um, I don't know if you can hear us now that we're live, but it looks like you came in as an attendee and not as a speaker. Um, you may need to log out and re-log in using the email that you signed up for for the session. Um, and then when you go, you should find your name as for this session as presenting, and maybe you can get in that way. I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can, give it a shot. In in the meantime, we'll we'll start start our session here. Mm-hmm. Um, talk a little bit about what we're doing for this session. Um, we've been talking for years about how the Internet of Things are going to improve business and our lives in general. Um, certainly, IoT has impacted all our lives, um, but deployment struggle to fulfill some of that initial promise that was laid out there in the early years. Um, in today's session, we're going to talk about successes that we've had. Um, we're going to talk about some inhibitors and enablers that allow these systems to be deployed in much larger scale to ultimately become that revolutionary force that was envisioned originally, providing a positive impact for everybody. In doing so, we want to reach beyond just talking about technology, but also consider the the human, economic, and other issues that shape the way that we use these technologies. Um, Before we do that, we'll take a couple of minutes here. And Francis, why don't you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your background and what you do Mm -hmm. at Bell Helicopter. Certainly, yeah. My name is Francis Govers. I'm the uh, Associate Technical Fellow for Autonomy at Bell Helicopter in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, My job is to teach helicopters to fly by themselves. We are currently embarked on a mission to um, automate all of our systems. And we look at those as having effects both as it's simplifying the way helicopters are operated making them easier and more accessible as well, uh, and then adding additional safety features, uh, making the, the, we call it refusing to crash. We're making a helicopter that refuses to crash. Uh, And then um, adding additional sensors and other systems, communications uh, to allow them to do new and and interesting things. We're, we're, We're very much involved with NASA and the Air Force and the FAA on the urban air mobility. Uh, you keep hearing about all these flying taxis and air cargo delivery systems. We're working very hard to help develop the infrastructure, uh, not the least because helicopters live in that airspace and uh, and have to coexist with those systems. So it's uh, in our interest to, to uh, shape help shape how that goes. Uh, and some of my background, I came up, started in the space program, uh, served in the Air Force, as a space communications specialist, and I went to NASA, ended up being the lead engineer for command and control in the International Space Station. I have spent half my career doing uh, unmanned systems, including seven self-driving cars. And um, like I said, now do self-flying helicopters. Cool. Okay. So I'm Jerry Power. Um, I'm CEO of i3 Systems. Um, we're a startup company based here in Los Angeles, and what we're dedicated to is sort of making data more usable, more manageable, especially sort of in federated ecosystems where there's lots of different players who control different pieces of that overall data lifecycle. Um, uh, I have a background. I come out of the communication industry, spending um, more than 25 years at Alcatel-Lucent, um, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I, I look at myself as sort of a, how do we how do we use data and how do we get data to who needs it? And I'm looking at Francis as sort of the expert and kind of how do we consume and make use of data, turn data into something that's of value. So hopefully we've got um, some good perspective here. Um, joining us sort of in the in the room, we have Abarj Gupta um, from Basis Vectors. He's not in the session as a speaker, um, Barish, if you can hear us and you have any comments, um, feel free to type them into the notes um, there. I've just given you the mic. Can you can you hear us? Can you, Abarish? Yes. Oh, I'm curious. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can Abarish, can you just give us a couple seconds, uh, a few minutes on your background and... Um, Absolutely. Um, hi, guys. I'm, 
my name is Ambarish Gupta. I'm the founder CEO of Base Directors. Um, it's, it's a private equity firm based in New York, USA. Um, we focus on B2B SaaS companies um, in US and Canada, especially focus on vertical B2B SaaS companies. And before that, I, I was founder of the largest B2B SaaS telephony company in Asia named Molarity, which I ran for a decade. I've been a consultant with uh, McKinsey and Company, um, advising large bank and insurance firms um, in US and specifically focus on operating improvements in um, in large manufacturing companies and, um, and, and, and the companies with very complex operations. Awesome, awesome. Well, let, let's start the conversation by talking about a little bit about privacy and security. Um, I mean, most anywhere you read, when people talk about issues related to data, IoT or AI, privacy and security sort of seem to steal the spotlight. Um, so why don't we just talk a little bit about that and how that's sort of serving as an inhibitor to what this 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 future bright world might look like. Um, I don't know, Francis, do you want to throw something in? Um, to um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, well, I'm certainly fascinated by this concept of everything being connected and everything being being able to talk to one another, having devices everywhere. Uh, been kind of running experiments at my own house where I have you know two Roomba robots running around. Uh, I have all the thermostats connected up to um, Starlink, uh, so I can monitor my house from anywhere around the world so um and certainly it seems like the the there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be created to make a lot of this stuff work certainly see that with the uh our our concept of uh, autonomous helicopters where we need you know bird ports places to land we need airways we need airspace we need corridors you know um to make all that happen so um it's hard to say on which kind of chicken and egg you want to enable the ability of things to talk to one another. You have to create those pathways. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, 5G rolling out and, you know, other types of communication. Starlink being another great example of, you know, how is this going to change if we have 200 megs a second of bandwidth anywhere in the world? Uh, and I mentioned I live 80 miles from the nearest town. Uh, so uh, I'm out in the country. And having the the satellite capability really has changed everything about being at being at the house because you know uh, we're we're in a place where we have no cell phone service, we have no uh, television service, we have no um, uh, what else? Uh, whatever you name. Oh, we couldn't get internet. So it was you know before we had satellite, we were kind of blissfully disconnected from the world, but not not anymore. Now it's, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week of high bandwidth <laughs> yeah. uh, talking, so. Barsh, do you have, what are your thoughts? I mean, I mean the, the um, I, I totally agree with you. The connectivity has just, just dramatically improved. Um, and, and I spent 10 years in Asia building up um, uh, the, the, my previous venture and, and that the cost of connectivity is so low, you know, for $2 a month, you can get mm -hmm. high speed internet connection in anywhere now in Asia. Um, the, the, this kind of connection, however, comes with connection for everyone. You know, the, um, the, everything is connected now. It's, um, today it, it may be servers and your cell phones and, and your databases that are connected. In, in 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 the in the near future, and I think probably present holidays, is the machines, um, the the your cars, your 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 um, your your tractors, your trucks, mm -hmm. um, uh, autonomous robots. You know, every everything is connected. On industrial machine is connected as well, and that means that um, the the this for somebody to invade a country, they, they, they don't have to physically get in the way. Um, it, it, it has happened in the past, you know, the hackers just can get in and, and start pulling out the IP and start destroying things. So from the security perspective, I think, I think the bar is much higher now, um, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of protecting things and, and controlling things because everything is connected. In terms of privacy, I, I, I feel, I almost feel 
that it's we are already far we have taken a big step back uh the consumer and b2b um and, and this is coming from my experience working with the marketing companies the data that is available on consumers um for every consumer every person the amount of data that is available using which people can be profiled is just is gigantic um and the same thing is happening with with the businesses as well so i i think with an increased connectivity with increased digitalization while it has dramatically improved the efficiency and visibility um, to things and things can be rolled out very quickly and new software improvement can be rolled out very quickly but it has also mean that the security um is a much bigger challenge now and the privacy is a much bigger challenge now yeah i i tend to separate when i try to think about this i separate privacy and security as being linked but independent issues i think mm-hmm. about security as being an issue related with how do you make sure the right people get the right data and not the wrong people so it's a good guy bad guy um kind of question um that you're sort of dealing with whereas i think of privacy as being different in that privacy um is how do you make sure the people who are legitimately able to have your data how do you make sure that they're doing what you expect or wanted agreed to to have them do that they're not doing something that they shouldn't do in, instead um certainly you you can't have privacy i mean privacy is not even a topic of conversation if you don't have security because mm-hmm. i mean you might control your what's being done with your data but if people are stealing your data and doing you have no control over that so once they've stolen it it's gone um but i look at privacy is how do you make sure that when you gave somebody the data you made an agreement you'd give them the data how do you make sure that that's actually what they're doing or how they not and that becomes sort of the privacy question um it does sort of at times bother me when people treat um privacy and security like it's um a black and white issue whereas i see it there's like lots of shades of gray i mean as you sort of start thinking about budgeting um to have security measures in place it's not like you spend this amount of money and you're done there's always something to be done you could always make it better it's how far do you go up that ladder um and on some on privacy there's also a ladder but it's a different kind of ladder in that um who i give my data to who i choose to give my data to and what they can do depends largely on how much i trust them or how much and they trust me giving them good data um and it could vary not the same data i might give it to one person to one company and not give it to somebody else and whether it's because i trust that person or not or because i believe in their goals their mission um but that becomes a very subjective personal kind of decision um and you can't sort of say here's what you should do or you shouldn't do as much as you have to give people the latitude to make that decision where security seems to be much more something you just have to do well, I, don't, i don't know what you guys think about that if i if i have to opine you know it's also i mean I, just separating out the security and privacy very much so and then security i think we all know increased connectivity means um that there you have lot lot more a lot lot more number of assets to kind of protect but on on the privacy the 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 spirit of having a privacy is that people the the entities do not know too much about you so you can maintain your independence and you you're not manipulated what 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 i meant earlier was there is so much personal data available which is not stolen which you actually have voluntarily provided that you can be profiled very accurately your your, your behavior can be modeled very accurately um and that data is legitimate legitimate that that the data is the little surveys that you have taken and then you know the cookies that you have accepted and and you know the and and maybe sometimes you know the, your data that has been stolen on, on on the dark web and then merged with this with this data set but what i'm saying is the the for 7 billion or so people and you know whoever is internet connected i don't know 4 billion 3 4 billion people whoever has a purchasing power or be a billion or half or so people in the world uh, there is a very fine grain data available to them so 
companies and, and hackers together can profile the each individual consumers for their behavior very well today. And this, this, this profiling, the ability to profile them is just constantly getting better and better. So when, when I talk about the future, what, what I'm saying is that anybody who wants to do mass manipulation or mass um, the, the, uh, the manipulation of consumers or, or profile consumers and, and businesses, they have the data available. The data points available to be able to do it at very high level of accuracy and we have seen this in elections we have seen this we see this in consumer marketing we see it everywhere so from that point of view the, the the idea of being anonymous being able to hide yourself and not let yeah. people know who you are yeah th that era is over yeah no no i i agree with that and i, and I think and, and i i know that some people talk about uh, the pii personally identifiable information um, and say, well, if we just block this kind of information, it's a step toward privacy. But there's, as you said, there's so much data out there um, that you can really build a profile without any PII information by assembling different sources of things together. Um, so the way that I think about things, I, I consider all data sort of PII. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think that's the way you sort of have to think about it. Um, you, you, you're, you're totally right. Um, in some cases, that data is out there, that spilt milk. Um, but I think looking forward, um, I think we need to figure out what the right path for privacy is. Um, I do believe that, I mean, in Europe, they have some pretty strong privacy regulations that's actually uh, negatively impacted their ability to collect data and understand the COVID outbreak. Um, so certainly you can go too far down that road, um, mm -hmm. but you can also be too lax. And I don't think that as a society, we figured out what that middle ground is. Yeah, I, and I think, we, you know, we talked about this with the, in terms of the Internet of Things, you know, the, the definition of what an Internet of Things device is, is we've taken something that normally would be isolated and we've connected it to the Internet. So we've taken a data, you know, almost every case, what are we doing with these Internet of Things devices? We're collecting data with them. Yeah. We're using them to pull data that was previously isolated and stick it onto the network so that it could be accessed. And certainly you know, when you talk about, you know, the I work in self-driving cars and the self-driving cars as they're driving down the street, they're mapping everywhere they go. They're recording what's there and taking the snapshots of movies and recording that information. I always said that Google's interest in self-driving cars had nothing to do with the cars. It had everything to do with the data. They wanted, basically, you know, the, there's no difference between a, Greek, a Google Street View data collection system and what's on an autonomous car. The, the, we map everywhere we go. We have to, because that's how it navigates. Uh, but, it, but when you have the ability to collect that information and store it, now it's a surveillance device. And, and we have to figure out, you know, what do we do with that? Uh, you know, every Tesla that's out there has collecting data all of the time and sending it back to Tesla. Um, and, and, you know, they're in, in the user agreement that you sign when you buy a Tesla, it says you telling us that this is okay, we can have your data. Everywhere you go and everything you see, we will see. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's 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 a fascinating world we're headed into with a lot of gray areas. I, I think that we should expect as we go into this that um, there are going to be more laws, um, laws, legislative issues. But I think also um, as companies start moving down this road, um, they'll establish um, more stringent and, and change frequently their data privacy mm -hmm. policies. Mm -hmm. um, as, yeah. as lawyers, as things change, as people start realizing that providing privacy is something consumers want, so you actually can get a market edge if you potentially yeah. offer the kind of privacy. That, people that, that, that goes a uh, business model. We're not going to track what you're doing on as you're surfing the network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, th I think that that's important. And, and to, for us as people who sort of work in that industry, that means that it's not like you can sort of say the old way of saying, oh, well, tell me all your requirements and I'll go build a system to go do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because by the time you get done building it, mm -hmm. the requirements will change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. You, so especially in this space, you have to build mm -hmm. for agility. 
Yes, um, yeah, yeah. That's why we adopted so-called agile methods of development because we discovered you can't figure out in advance what it is that you're making. It's going to evolve uh, along the way. Uh, you know, there's some. I must say, in aerospace, we haven't. In we're kind of halfway in between. We haven't embraced the concept of uh, of um, design as you go, but we have. We're trying to do things in an agile way and get away from this very rigid waterfall world. But uh, we're still design. You know, writing requirements. We're still saying in advance, this is what it's going to do ten years from now. In fact, that's my job. That's my job is to write, say, this is what ten years from now, this is what helicopters are going to look like. I live five years ahead of everybody else is my job as a in the innovation department at Bell as a tech fellow. You know, I'm I'm looking at the world of 2030. Yeah, you know, more than I am. I live in that world more than I am in 2022. Yeah, but but to do that, it'd be interesting. And I don't know if you want to expand a little on how you do that, but I think you sort of have to anticipate well i'm going to say this is going to happen but that's a that's a building block that may or may not be there once we get down the road yeah it is and and i'm I'm very active i'm one of the things i'm on four or five different committees with astm uh with rtca on changing the infrastructure you know how do we do safety for autonomous vehicles how do we do certification how do we do um uh, trust you know that's that's a big topic we actually talk about quite a lot how do we build trust in an autonomous system if i'm going to give you a self-driving car and you're going to trust to take your hands off the wheel and do the classic you know sit behind the wheel like this with the with the uh, i have i have 50 pictures of myself with my arms like this sitting behind the wheel of a car driving itself to show that i'm not driving the car mm-hmm. you know most of the time i'm gripping the wheel quite hard <laughs> excuse me um but uh anyway but building that trust yeah and, and the trust comes from as at least as we're defining it for vehicles in the vehicle behaving the way you want it to behave uh in the in that doing what you expect to do and not doing things that so we even had to change the decision making metrics because honestly the robot or the autonomous system will make makes decisions completely different than the ways humans do because they perceive the world differently than humans do. They only can perceive what I tell them to perceive. And um, and so, you know, a typical example is, you know, the, the algorithm won't think twice of taking you through 14 neighborhoods and 23 stop signs to save you 12 seconds on your commute to work. But you wouldn't do that in reality because it's tedious and it's and it's you're a lot of start and starting and stopping and you'd much rather sit in slow traffic on the highway but go direct than take 14 turns. So um, you know that that sort of thing we have to build into the system and say give me the simplest way there instead of the shortest way. Now actually, I one of my my pet peeves is I hate systems that do the shortest route all the time because that just not is. It, as much as you would say, oh, that's the way to go. You just always take the shortest route. No, you don't always take the shortest route. So, um, uh, and it's, you know, trying to trying to deliver that and say, I want the lowest, for the helicopter, I want the lowest risk path. That's the one we take. We take the path that gives exposes us to the least amount of risk, uh, which is not the shortest path. Absolutely not the shortest path. It's it's interesting to me that you keyed in on trust. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think trust um, from, from what I do and sort of how do you manage passing data between organizations and how do you coordinate um, trust is is a critical issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, if one organization is going to get data from another organization, they have to have some trust in its validity. It was validly mm-hmm. obtained, and, and without trust, I mean, it, the whole system sort of falls apart. Yeah, which comes full circle in our discussion about security and privacy. Yeah. Um, this and, is the other side of that coin is you have security and privacy that generates trust. Yeah. And 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 I think back, I mean, even if you go back and look historically, um, the leaps um, that we've made as society, I think, have been largely based on something happened that improved trust capabilities. I mean, you think about um, manufacturing, the, the manufacturing age, I mean, you were able to start building products that you could trust were always the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at the advances that were made in the financial institutions. I mean, that was because they were able to get trust. And, and certainly 
in today's world, you you can also see examples of where people have done things to lose trust and the negative yeah. implications of that. Um, yes, yes, very much so. I, I, I don't think a lot of those learnings have been necessarily applied to technology the way no. that they probably should. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there have been a few weird uh, adoptions of things that shouldn't have ever <laughs> been gone forward, you know. Uh, Abarsh, I see that you sort of dropped back into the um, into the room and off the speaker. I don't know if you've got anything to add or not. I'm um, just hit that, take the microphone if if you want to jump in. Um, yeah, er, earlier, Francis mm -hmm. and I were talking about about technology and impediments, and I think both of us um, are of the opinion that a lot of the impediments associated with technology are less about technology. Oh, oh I see you asking for the mic. There must be a delay there. Um, but but the impediments to technology are, are often not that technology doesn't work. I mean, we've gotten to where, I mean, mm -hmm. if you can think of something, there's there's probably a way to build it. Um, but it's it's about all those human factors, economic factors that surround the deployment of technology um, that actually make project successes or failures. Um, okay, go ahead, Marsh. Hey, <clears throat> finally you can see me as well. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, you know, I think it's very important um, to have a face for trust. Um, you know, the, the, you could you could use the Zoom call as much as you want with the audio, but the video just makes a big difference. Um, I, I, I totally agree with you, and, and you know, that's the reason I was not grabbing the mic. You know, the the the, um, the trust is the foundation of any system, um, and it's foundation of society, um, and uh, technology is just a tool. Um, so if the technology systems are not, they, they, if they are not operating with you with, with the same interface, the same language that we understand, um, and, and use the same language, you know, we are not going to trust them. So um, the, the for some, anything to be useful, you know, it, it has to be trust, trustworthy. And I think in technology system, what what you consider is. Uh, reliability of the systems, um, the the, uh, the user interface, which should be natural and and you know understandable and not cryptic, uh, which is you know is probably like is 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 a form of trust, something that 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 you are familiar with, um, and, and knowing that you know it it will not do any harm to you, you know. So, so without getting too much in details, you know, I think everything that you're talking about makes a lot of sense, and and. In today's products, if you see technology product, there's so much focus on user experience, um, how natural the user experience is, how easy it is. Um, and the ones which have the best user experience win. Um, case in point, you know, iPhone compared to, you know, every other phone that came before that, you know, just very simple interface of you know, using your fingers to type. It's just kind mm -hmm. of, it's yeah. just changed everything. Um, um, so uh, the... the I totally agree with you, and I think this will continue. And um, unfortunately, when the technology system first come, they are not not very easy to use because everybody is focused on just kind of making sure it works. Um, but mass adoption happens when when the easy to use and the easiest to use is it's, is where where nobody has to read up the manual; they can just pick up the things and it starts working. My my, my nephew and niece, um, when they were they were like two three year old, they could use iPad. Um, without any problem, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that that is example of um, you know just very well understood system, a very natural system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my four year old grandkids, uh, for three uh, we have one and three, and one is four, and they are the best I, iPad users you've ever seen. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, there's really so much investment. It. There's so much yeah. investment in user interface, and it's right. So otherwise, mm -hmm. there's not any adoption. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, they were not going to go on on uh, Unix. Uh, uh, prompt yeah. and start typing, you know, re remove minus RF. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So to back up a little bit on, on, on sort of the trust issue, I think um, that we're at an interesting point in history right now in, in that when I look around and I see how what people are doing, um, I think there, and, and I guess this applies to technology, but it also applies even outside of the technology world. 
I get this sense that there are some people who've sort of given up on trust and are trying to build systems to to work in untrusted environments. Um, and, and there are others that are working to sort of improve trust and sort of how do we make things better um, overall. And, and I see these as sort of really sort of divergent views um, as to how the future of the world is going to evolve, um, whether, whether trust is integral to it and we sort of dedicate ourselves to working together as a society or whether instead we as a society begin to fragment more and more and more to where everybody's individual and there is no real way to sort of build trust. And I, I think what happens in society is going to greatly impact the way we think about things as technologists. Um, so that's that might be a topic for a, a future Horasis session, but it's certainly a fascinating thing to think about. Yeah, I would think so. I have to say I'm, I'm quite concerned that there are a lot of people that uh, – are out in the world basing their view of the world or the view of how society works on misinformation and on uh, incorrect, let's say, view of how things work or what people's interests are or what uh, what's true and what's not true and uh, what are facts and what are not facts. And a lot of the, you know, having grown up in the, in the 60s and we're you know, we saw how hard fought the uh, hard won the civil rights that we enjoy today are to see those slipping back here in the United States, at least. And I know this is happening in other countries as well, um, is very painful. And technology has definitely played a role in making that worse in making it far easier for for lies and for misinformation to get out and to be presented as as reality and we just have to look at the covid from the what happened with covid with the vaccines that people were suddenly went from you know before covid there was no way you ever questioned i've never saw anyone who questioned there were a few anti-vaccine fringe people but there it was not a mainstream concept and now it is and we had you know lots and lots of people who honestly died needlessly because of misinformation because of mistruths that were out in in the uh in in the in the internet or in in the infosphere and um and rather than trusting having you know no trustable news source or having ability to live in a bubble where no outside information could come in you know this is this is a very scary trend yeah i mean uh, my, my view would be that, that, that while this kind of abuse can happen on the technology, mm -hmm. system, an example would be the self-driving car that you're driving mm -hmm. get hacked um, yes. because it's connected to network. Um, the it is known as a problem statement. It self proves the technology systems expect trust to come back. Um, so, for example, Facebook, the um, and Twitter, more, more Facebook. The the, the 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 fake news and proliferation of the fake news um, has caused disengagement of the user mm -hmm. from platform themselves, right? Um, so it may I think the point that I'm making is while technology can be misused and it can abuse the user um, and breach their breach the trust, that does not make the user want to use the technology more. That make the user use the technology less, and yeah. you know, if it continues, um, the, the tool will not be used. So, in the short term, trust trust can be breached uh, in the technology system, and a lot of damage can be done. But in mm -hmm. long in the long term, it's self correcting. Uh, people move out of from that tool itself, which is underlying. I, I sincerely hope so. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I and I think you have to sort of say statements like that with. The majority of people will, but there's always going to be some people who are trying to um, do the unexpected, do things to skirt the rules or, or have mm -hmm. ill intent in, in, in mind. Um, so it never really gets to be a universal thing as much as it is, how do we move forward as a group together? Um, there's a saying that you, you can fool some people all the time and you can fool <laughs> people sometime. 
but you can fool all the people all the time, right? Yeah. And and and, and this came before Facebook, right? You know, this is statement, uh, if yeah. I remember correctly. It's considerably so, older than Facebook. <laughs> but, but somehow that rule doesn't stop people from trying. It does not. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a human nature, right? I mean, yeah. irrespective of whatever you make, as soon as the computers came, virus came as well. Um, yeah. As soon as people figured out how to, how to use atomic energy, the bombs came. And, and you know, the, the so, so I, th- I think it's... It's, it's lockstep. Yeah. I mean, I, I encounter that in, you know, the, one of the biggest problems I have, and then I get this all the time with self-driving cars, is people go, would you have a self-driving car? And they said, no, I don't want robots to take over the world. I said, how do you get from a self-driving car to robots taking over the world? But I mean, they put that up as a, I mean, there have been like congressional hearings where that was the point of contention where you go, oh, this robot, this is going to lead to robots taking over society and eliminating all humans and we're all going to die. I mean, that's, that's not what this does. <laughs> it just takes you to the grocery store. So, I, but, but, I, I, think, I think as soon as the, the robots are bringing pizzas, small uh, robots are bringing pizza, people just will be fine. And the day they, they start bringing kind of guns, you know, somebody had install a gun and yeah, it's, it's, is, it's, I mean, if you have seen this in history. <laughs> yeah. Give 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 a a, a a robot a can carry a weapon carry permit. <laughs> yeah. So though this is this is a good segue because I mean it, yeah there's there's people taking over the world but I mean there's also the thing about well what do robots do are they going to take away jobs from people are they going to take away creativity and then everything sort of becomes um, all everybody gets vanilla homogenized. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think I think that sort of you hear often uh, as maybe an outcome of all this automation and and AI and data. Uh, I sort of like to get your guys' view on on what what you would say to people who who that express that opinion. Okay, now I'll start if you don't mind. And I'll, um, I actually been researching this quite a bit, uh, having worked now in the automation and autonomy business for quite a while. Uh, I've written a book on artificial intelligence. Hold, and, Francis, uh, hold the book up. You get, to, book up. You get right. to do a plug. I, he, he's promised me I get to plug my book. So there we go. Artificial <laughs> intelligence for robotics. So, you know, that's, I, I do this for a living. So there is nothing in the, the, what the thing that we call artificial intelligence today, first of all, is not artificial intelligence. It's non-deterministic algorithms that are, what do we call them? Nonlinear approximations. Um, and they don't generalize, which means you don't have an, if you create an algorithm that does, let's say, recognizes chess pieces, you can, cannot then use that to uh, do accounting. You know, it doesn't generalize. The concepts in artificial intelligence don't let you build a general intelligence like we are. We are general intelligences. We can do perception and we can do learning and we can do building and we get creativity. And when we build an artificial intelligence program, it does one thing and generally poorly. And um, so there is not a, first of all, there's not a path from where we are now that the stone knives and bear skins we are currently using to build software and the kind of software that's living inside of our brains that allows us to be what we are. Um, and there's no there's no path and there's no you have to look at you know you would you could kind of reverse engineer this and say what would it take to have a robot that wants to take over the world or that would take over the world the first question is it's got to want to take over the world why would it want to take over the world well robots don't have wants they don't have feelings they don't have emotions they just have programming so um you know there's not uh an impetus that, you know, they talk about, you know, people are with the singularity and, and systems are suddenly going to reprogram themselves to have feelings and emotions. That doesn't just happen. Um, it has the, the structures and the the pieces have to be there. So anyway, it's, it's, there's a big giant gulf between where we are now, which honestly, in, in terms of intelligence is tiny little steps and, um, uh, where we need to be. One other thing to say about uh, neurons that are in our brain as compared to the neurons that are in computers is that our neurons and our brains have enormous bandwidth. 
while they're fairly slow and they communicate data slowly, the data that they collect and move is rich. It is entirely analog and it's it has an enormous bandwidth. And the 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 processing that goes on inside a single neuron, one uh, blue brain project in Switzerland, uh, did a simulation of a neuron chemical process, and it was 10,000 lines of code per neuron. So a typical neural network's got three lines of code per neuron. So uh, it's it's far, far more complex than uh, than we've modeled it as. So anyway, so my, my note is you can't get there from here. <laughs> And uh, and we haven't even invented. We don't. We're using the wrong tools and the wrong processes and even the wrong concepts to go from digital computers to true uh, general intelligence. Okay. Next. <laughs> All right. well, my, my, my view. Um, I, I agree with you, Francis. Uh, the. the the, the, the computers are not going to become one day self-aware and, you know, mm -hmm. just decide that, you know, we are child, we are children and they, they need to take care of them by killing us and converting us into batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that that's going to be the case. Uh, but I think that there's a still, if you look at the history um, of last, let's say, I don't know, thousand years or, or 1500 years or so, uh, the the top 0.1 percent of the people of the world, they have more wealth today compared. You know, if the total world wealth is 100, um, they have a higher percentage of the total world wealth and their power now uh, than than they had earlier. And, and and the real reason for that is most of the labor, and the labor is not general intelligence most of the time. Most of the work is somewhat simpler. Um, mm -hmm is progressively being replaced by specialized AI and robots, right? So the dependence of somebody who is powerful on fellow human being is reducing. Um, and that is why the, the wealth curve, which used to be like this, it has become like this, um, or progressively becoming like this. So I, th I think the real impact um, of robotics and AI and various kinds of AI, not not let's say less intelligent, but it's still very useful AI, is the power can progressively be concentrated in the hands of very few number of people. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reason democracy works um, is that you may be the king and you may have trillion dollars, but you still need servants and soldiers to, to protect you and take care of you. Um, and they are fellow human being, right? Um, I don't find that reassuring somehow, but yeah. Yeah, you, you can depend on their loyalty. Their loyalty can switch, and we have seen revolutions all the time. They've been mm -hmm. murdered, things and, and, and those yeah. murders. Robots are loyal uh, once you program program them. Yeah. If you depend on them, if you if you have soldiers and servants who are robots, and if you can kind of somehow um, uh, the, the protect yourself or overpower the rest of the human being with limited number of people, that becomes a dangerous thing. So my, my problem is. It's a couple of self-aware human and a very large number of robots um, uh, abusing the rest of the humanity. Mm -hmm. And and that probability is going up. Okay. I can't argue with that. Okay. So, so, yeah, so I, I tend to think about AI and data not as a replacement for human ingenuity, what humans do, as much as it's a force multiplier. So if, mm -hmm. because it sort of takes what the programmer or what if he was building a system that emulated an expert, it, it takes that and automates it to go really fast. Mm -hmm. um, but that source of, of creativity is still human. And if you can sort of start doing this faster, it actually, I think, lets people be more, it might actually let people be more creative. Yeah. Um, so so this this idea that, that robots and all this AI is gonna replace humans, I think it changes what humans do, what skills we need, the way we look at the world, but it doesn't really replace, eliminate jobs um, in fact, it actually might cause jobs to increase. Oh, um, that's that's what I think. Absolutely. Yeah. The 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 I other that's what we've seen. That's what we're seeing today. Yeah. 
Um, but it's 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 a different kind of jobs, and it says that people have to um, continually um, re-educate themselves and make them ready for a world that's changing faster and faster. The idea mm -hmm. that you could take a job when you were um, out of high school or out of college and you would retire from that job some 40 or 50 years later having done the same thing. I think that's the real casualty. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, I look at that as much of a casualty. I think that's kind of a boring life. And um, I think that's actually yeah, where, you know, other people feel differently about them. But yeah. I, I agree with you because I, that's how I feel. Is that I've had to retrain myself six, seven, eight times. Yeah. The, the the other thing that I think about, and and this is this is I'm more on thin ice here, um, but if if a programmer is writing a program for his company and it's basically doing X um, through automation, um, the company is still sort of responsible for what that product does. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some legal liability associated with it. So I think. If you build this, these automated systems, you have to build in data collection. Um, you have to have people to oversee things and make sure that it's doing what was intended in the first place. Um, so, and, and, and I think that people forget that a lot more automated systems I mean there's more people sort of watching the watchers, watching yeah. these automated systems. Yeah. Jerry, we're out of time. We're out of we're out of time. Um, I appreciated the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think it's been interesting. We covered a lot of very different ground, um, yes. but by all means, keep in touch. And if anybody's mm -hmm. on the session, um, reach out to us through the Run the World application. I'm sure, and yeah. we'd like to hear your views as well. Yes, absolutely. Very nice to meet everybody, and really enjoyed it. Abarish, a pleasure. Jerry, thank you. With you, Jerry and Francis. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.